the initially, initially when uh, I started to work with uh, Carol Curry, who's sitting back there, uh, it, when she was a teacher and she was coming to one of our African American in service teacher uh, planning and teacher um, uh, education uh, weekends. It was like a Saturday and then a Sunday. And uh, as I remember, it was like over two days with a break and everybody could go home and then come back the next day, as I recall. In any case, um, this, was, this would have been an element or a long chapter within the broader and longer story of African-American achievement in Florida. And just to start us in that, uh, we, can't, we can't lose our way here, but just to remind everybody, this is Black History Month, and you cannot go back any, any, any further back that we know of than 1513 uh, to find anybody who certainly visited this peninsula that we call Florida. It may be that somebody was here before then, but we don't know that. In any case, in 1513, Ponce de Leon comes up from Puerto Rico in three vessels, and among those people that are with him are an individual named Juan Garrido, who was a Spanish soldier, African, by the way, free, by the way, and one of those people who was trying to uh, establish a, a Spanish presence in what we today still call Florida, even though we pronounce it differently than they did. There was also at least one sailor on, the on, on one of the vessels whose name was Jorge, and he was described as El Negro Jorge, the black man George, you might, you might say. I can tell you that from that point on, with all of the investigations and the explorations and everything, uh, Panfilo de Narvaez and then De Soto and, and all of those people, Menendez that came later and on and on and on, everything that happened in Florida that I can tell you about that I know anything about included the participation and the talents of African or African-American people. They were here from the beginning. Their history is woven into the tapestry of the history of Florida. Now, the program that we developed then and we presented with updates was called African American Achievement in Florida, 1513 to the present. We're going to have to depart from that tonight to talk about a sub-element within that and a very unhappy time in Florida's criminal justice history, in, in, in the history, the political history of the state, uh, with, with the harm that it did and the harm that it continued to do uh, in between the years that you see here, 1877 to 1923. And as we will see, it didn't end, unfortunately, in 1923. But if we go to the first slide, and this is where I've worked out a uh, partnership with Father Dustin. My arms aren't long enough to get over there, but he's very kindly, uh, you know, uh, volunteered to, uh, to be there. And uh, now you see this picture of the Florida Capitol. And the reason that I start with that is because this was the capital of Florida as it was just finished in 1845, just in time for Florida to come into the Union as the 27th state. Tragically, it was a slave state that entered the Union in 1845, and this was the capital that they, that they uh, you know, this is where Florida government was housed. All three branches of government were inside this relatively small building. Over the years, the building was added to multiple times, and in 1978, they cut it back uh, to the 1902 version. So what you see today downtown is a little larger than this one, but this is the important thing. Inside the slightly larger version of the Capitol is this building that is still enshrined as the core of that old building. So Florida comes into the Union and this is the Capitol. Florida leaves the Union, the third state to do so, and this is the Capitol where they made that decision. Florida comes back into the Union with the stars and stripes waving over the Capitol in 1865, this building again. Then with people coming into power who had been pro-Confederate in their sympathies uh, and trying to work out a, a uh, constitution that would give them the control that they wanted over Floridians and over Florida, in 1865, the radical Congress would not accept it. So that meant that Florida had to start off another constitution, and that one happened in 1868. And while this was going on, of course, we know that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, the same year that the 13th Amendment became law. And that's part of our story too. But so we don't get ahead here, let's go to the next slide. And uh, uh, speaking of the 13th Amendment, this looks so good. It looks so good. Uh, uh, section one, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. But here's the loophole except as a punishment 
for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. That means that there is a loophole to incorporate legalized slavery if you can just prove that the person you are putting into this bind has been adjudicated guilty of the crime for which they have just been convicted. If that, you can arrange that, then it says we can do this. Now originally, that didn't happen in Florida. We can go to the next slide there, but they will come back to this 13th Amendment. Okay, in, 18, in 1876 there was, believe it or not, a disputed election that Florida had a lot to do with. Now if that sounds like recent history, I don't blame you. That comes back to the year 2000, but way earlier. Go back to 1876, you have the, uh, 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 Samuel J. Tilden on the left, the Democrat, who is vying for presidency, vying to be elected president, against Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican. Now, this was, this was a, a disastrously bad election with all kinds of recriminations on all sides about foul and not going by the, the rules and all of this. But what happened as a result was, by that time in the 1870s, there was less and less support for the occupying federal forces who had been in Florida since 1865 to remain. So now it's 1877 and the, the, uh, the Republicans say, if you'll just authorize Rutherford B. Hayes as the winner in your electoral college, we will withdraw federal troops from South Carolina, Louisiana, Oregon, and most of them were gone from Florida by this time. So it was called the fraud of the century, this election. But that is what happened, and Rutherford B. Hayes ascended as the president, and Samuel Tilden stepped away. What did this mean for Florida? Let's go to the next slide, if you will. And it meant that the Democrats are now uh, fully in, in, uh, 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 in if, in fact, if we can go one beyond him. Uh, all right. Um, now we have Governor Drew, Democrat, who comes to power, or come, uh, comes into the governorship in 18, uh, the date is on here, in, in uh, 1877, in fact, in January of that year. He has looked very carefully at Florida's political history in the last few years when the Republicans were in control. And the Republicans actually explored the idea of utilizing convict labor. Why? Because the state maybe could get some money. We'll rent these people out, they were thinking, and money will come in, but they didn't really organize it as a program. Now, however, it does become organized as a program. And unfortunately, with racial feelings as they were, and with people who were former, either former Confederates or supporters of the Confederacy idea, or former slave old holders, or businessmen who were in constitutionally democratic in their, in their outlook, they're all for the ideas that come about now in the black codes. These are laws that are passed whereby a person who is accused of loitering, vagrancy, or almost any activity whereby they, they might not be actively in, employed in working, but if, if you can show or if the sheriff believes that they're just walking around aimlessly and, and, and you know, unaffiliated with any, any meaningful work, take them and adjudicate, put them in front of a judge and we'll have a trial. And if you can do that, then you can actually have a, a prison system in Florida, which Florida was late coming to the prison system. And initially they had prisoners, but they didn't really have a prison. They tried to use the old armory in Chattahoochee as the state prison, but it was only marginally successful. And as more and more people started to follow Drew's ideas and his, and his supporters about putting people out to work and deriving benefit from it, the system just took over and, and started to go. I mentioned the racism involved in this, and, and uh, from the reading that I've done, it, it appears that there were a lot of people in political control once the Republicans and the soldiers all left, and Florida was back into its democratic control, white you know, supremacy and all of those ideas that seemed to be just under the surface. Once, once you had all of that, you have the means, because you're making the laws and you're enforcing the laws, to make this thing go almost anywhere you want it to. At the same time, there were people with business interests in the forest who couldn't get enough laborers. One thing Florida had need of was labor. It had forests. It had mines. It had phosphate down around Polk County. And it had, as we mentioned, it had pine trees all over, the ones you saw in your, in your driving back and forth. It's got lots of potential, but it doesn't have labor. So now, you take people who are swelling in the, especially in the cities, because this is where an urban, free, black population was feared 
by the people who were in political control at the time. And so these unjust laws were passed in a way to allow the justice system to grab people in order to fill the coffers that were needed to put them to work el elsewhere. They weren't really uh, uh, jailed uh, here except to hold them maybe very briefly, but the idea was to farm them out to labor. It, w it got so bad that there were bounties offered by companies to law enforcement people. Bring me five people and I'll give you $20 a head for those people. And if you put them in jail for 90 days, you have to, to get the money out of them that you have paid, you're going to work them just as hard as you know how. There will be very little in terms of compensation going to the people who are doing the most severe labor. And, and there's no question about this. It will fall most heavily on the African American population. There will be some white uh, people who will also be arrested, as we will see. They're part of the big part of the story. But they were way outnumbered by the people who were African American and who were chained to the, to the uh, terrible, uh, you know, uh, 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 onerous duties that they had to perform. We'll go now to the, uh, just past him. This is a picture. This is, comes from the Florida Memory Project. And uh, the, uh, the, the, this is the uh, uh, State Archives of Florida. It shows just one of the, of the housing, let's use the word light, lightly, it's, it's housing provided for Florida convicts that were farmed out to, the, to these outlying areas to do, uh, to do business. Inside, there's almost no draft, there's almost no windows for any kind of fresh air. They lock people, they chain them, they close the doors, and, and uh, if there's a fire, prisoners will die. And they did. I mean, it was a horrible situation with nobody looking over the shoulder of anybody who was in control here to guarantee anybody's rights. And so it languished, and it grew, and it just got terrible. A person who was on, uh, remind me, Father, if you will, I have a bibliography sheet to hand out to each one of you. And one of those, one of those is a book by J.C. Powell called The American Siberia. And he talks about those early days under a, under a warden by the name of Martin, where people who weren't working hard enough were strung up by their thumbs again and again and again, as maybe they were desperately ill, maybe with malaria, maybe with who knows what else. They just physically could not work. And if they were hung up again and again, eventually the thumbs grew to be the same length as their other fingers. He describes this very well, and he's a veteran of this. He was a captain that enforced a lot of the rules, and he wrote a book about it. It's horrendous reading. Anyway, this goes on, and this then is, is the housing that you would see. Uh, the, the men were dressed in rags. The shoes that they had were not boots. They were cheap shoes that fell apart with the, if you, uh, uh, any of you who, my surveying background, any of you have been out there, sir, you're welcome to jump in here, with the saw palmetto plants that we have in Florida. They'll tear your shoes up, stepping in and over and along them. They just, they've got razor edges and they just cut you, cut your, your feet and your shoes to ribbons. Once you don't have shoes, then it becomes your feet. Father's letter that he wrote, he talked about how feet, how much his feet hurt, the author of that letter and how he desperately needed shoes, and he couldn't get them, and could, just could not. So we go to the next one then. This is a mess hall where there's, no, there's absolutely no control that a prisoner has over what is served or how much he eats. And so it's minimal, I can tell you. The businesses were, were at rock bottom. They wanted to put into the, prison, uh, to the prisoner's uh, welfare the least that they had to put in to get the most of the work out of that person. And again, many of the people who were here, uh, involved in all of this died as a result of bad nutrition, as a result of being sick, as a result of having no medical, uh, no real medical protection. There were occasional doctors, but it, 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 in the cases that you read about, they seem to have been just paralyzed by the immensity of the sicknesses they were dealing with and unable to cope with, uh, with, with the losses and all. So we go again, and this is almost like turning time back. We can't go back to 1909 or 1910. Thankfully, and I say this because we have to know the truth of this. We have to keep it always before us. And so the photographs allow us to do that. This is the infamous sweat box where there are four, there's a, like a tower with a metal roof over it, and the inside cells are two feet nine inches on each side. There's just enough room for a person to stand in there and swelter. Okay, the, the sweat box was, was designed 
to cause a person who was not working well to become motivated to get out of this. He's going to swear he'll work better. Just let me out. They're not given any water when they're in there, and they're, you know, dehydrated from it. And again, many people died from it. They were getting heat stroke in there, and nobody was taking care of them. So this thing does not go away. It stays as this, this monumental icon almost of, of uh, intolerance and, 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 and torture. If we go past this slide, this is a, a, a New York uh, Times article from 1906, and it talks about uh, arrests were being made in New York because people, unscrupulous people, were going to the docks and they were getting immigrants just coming off the boats in New York and from the Lower East Side, which would include Jews and other really uh, poor immigrants coming into the country and give them a, a great talk about all the opportunities that existed in Florida and get them to go to Florida on, of course, expenses are paid by these companies and they want to get their expenses back. They sign these contracts and now they're held legally to a contract they cannot quit. And they're put into these same kinds of convict lease prisons with other convict lease prisoners. They're not convict lease, but it's the same, it's the same set. It's the same, it's the same set of, uh, of, uh, of conditions. And it's horrible for them too. I uh, thought somebody had a question. Uh, but anyway, there are arrests made, and this, this is New York Times, 1906. This is the age of muckraking, by the way. You know, you have uh, people who are writing about the horrors of the meat plants and all kinds of other, Ida Torbell and, and many other writers of the period were exposing the things that were wrong. And along with that were the Florida prisons. And, and it, it becomes almost, well, it truly becomes sickening to read, <coughs> bless you, of the, of the excesses that were possible and that were done, historically that actually were done again and again to Florida prisoners. If we go to the next one now, we could see that uh, this is Cosmopolitan magazine from March of 1907. And the author of this exposes, this is Richard Berry. He, he studies what's happening in Florida and he writes this national article and he excoriates the whole system. By now, prisoners are being used, yes, to make turpentine and to, and to use turpentine and extract it from the trees, but also to build roads and to do mining down in the phosphate mines, as we talked about, and to work in the lumber industry. You know, how many board feet can they cut and, and, and do so under the most horrendous of circumstances? And Barry writes about all of this and publishes it as early as 1907. And one of the people that he really lambastes is, uh, is, is the, uh, is the uh, uh, Flagler, Henry Flagler, who was uh, at the time building this uh, Florida East Coast Railway. And where do you think he was getting his labor? Because he could do it, he did do it. And he has lots and lots of African-American prisoners who are working for him under horrendous circumstances that Mr. Berry exposes. You can find this article and it's listed in the bibliography and we'll come back to it in another context in just a moment. Now this to me, of all the horrible photos that you can find, this to me says more words than, than I can find. And on the other hand, it sort of strikes us to silence. You see people, African-American prisoners, dead tired, standing there with sap all over their, their uniforms, their black and white prison uniforms. You see the implements that they're using here with the, to scoop out uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, the, in, in rendering the, uh, the turp, the, in rendering it, uh, the pine sap into turpentine. They have, to, they have to use all of this and it gets all over the skin. It burns, you can't get rid of it, you can't wash it off, there's no way to get rid of it. So you just kind of, you know, this is just part of your life. Going back to J.C. Powell, he was amazed when he said, the Florida Siberia, as he called it, that people would work in these areas and even if they had a month left to go, they would try to escape because they couldn't stand 30 more days of this. They would get to that point where it was so onerous, anything was preferable to staying. Look in the background, right here, wearing that boater hat, you see this young man and his father in this roadster of the, about 1910, and they're just riding along. Now their hands are clean. Their clothes are lily white, you know? They're not getting anywhere near. Uh, gum or turpentine or anything else, but they're deriving the benefit of the work that all these people in front are doing. Uh, I was able to borrow from the, uh, from the Museum of Florida History a couple of items, and there is one among us, his name is uh, David, I'm sorry I don't know your last name, sir, 
Sir? Yeah, no, it's Morse. But yeah, that's yeah, Morse, a, Mr. Morse. A, I've heard of the cup. Um, and um, it was it was used in the turpentine business. Um, this was a big improvement. As a matter of fact, the, the hmm. you know the fellow that invented this, him and his partner. Um, and this is actually an artifact. If you find this yes. in woods, you're supposed to leave it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but uh, it. Um, this was a big improvement because in the turpentine trade, um, they, they were treating the trees in a sense as these chemical factories. There was a lot of products that could be derived from the turpentine resin that was extracted. But basically the trees were what they call cat face. They were just cut, scored, cut in, in this I'm sure you can see that, but... cut all the way down one surface, mm -hmm. one face of the tree. And then um, originally, um, a box, you would know, call it a box, but basically a, it was partially uh, cut into so that the tree. sap would accumulate on this partial stump, if you will, that was cut. The whole tree wasn't cut, but it was partially cut out. And then the, hmm. the resin would ooze and collect there. But this was an improvement because this was nailed, that's the hole there, nailed underneath. And so this is at this time period that um, Mr. Peter is talking about, mm. that this was actually nailed to the tree underneath the scoring, the cat um, face, mm -hmm. and then this would collect it, and then the, the men would actually, you know, take this and get the, the resin turpentine out of this. You might point out, too, that yeah. there's some gum in the bottom there. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. still, after all these years, there's some stuck in the bottom of that uh, yeah. So there's a container. lot of these still, most of them are broken because yeah. of... Just my, uh, the machinery that has moved through the forest, but there's a lot of this that still are fragments that can still be found in the woods. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have an eye for it, but I can drive around in a sense because we're so heavily forested here, and mm -hmm. I can spot cat face trees mm -hmm. easily. The whole panacea unit of St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge was a former turpentine mm -hmm. forest, and I, I can just, uh, you know, I can eyeball the Mm -hmm. out there. Sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and we could go to the next slide there, but you see the misery that they're facing every day. The absolute misery. There, there are no words here to, 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 to convey that, but just what you can see just strikes you to silence. Uh, this is a, a team <coughs> delivering the rendered, uh, you know, material. This actually has to be uh, further purified but they're bringing it in out of the fields in these large barrels, and then it will, you know, be uh, treated again. Actually, the business is called, more properly, Naval Stores, but it is what they, what, what turpentine came from, and before they could make it chemically in other ways, they really depended on Florida and other places where they had pines to, uh, to, to, uh, to help to create that. Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. All right, here's another one now. You have a, you, just, look, when you look at this picture, just like the last one, there are no white faces this time in this one at all. These are prisoners who are black and who, I mean, they're, they have the, just the most minimal clothing, a hat to keep the sun off them and, and covering for their body and, and not much else. And they're holding tools here, forestry tools, um, a, a slightly different version of the application from what we just saw, but, uh, but they're, you know, they're not happy. They're not happy at all. They have no, no reason and nothing to smile about. And they're miserable because they're stuck there day after day, and there is no escape. Uh, frequently, these camps, well, virtually all of them, had somebody called a whipping boss. And he walked around with a long strap, and uh, he just, just many times just dying to use this thing. And uh, he beat people and, 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 and for the slightest infraction. If you ask for a pair of shoes, you might get a, the worst beating you've ever had. Uh, it's things like that. People were deathly scared of these people because they had so much power. And, um, and we will see how that fit factors into our story in a minute. All, always white, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the whipping boss. Here's a road being constructed, and you can see the old car that's right there. Uh, again, Florida was in boom, at least for demand. Uh, today, Florida's major industry, its number one, is, of course, tourism. But it was coming. It was coming even back in this early days. They couldn't, the state could not get enough people to come to Florida. So any transportation improvement that they could make was overdue. And the sooner they made it, then they would, they would get people to come in. We can go to the next one. Yeah, thanks, Father. 
uh, Florida's convict lease system. Here we go. And this is a different road, but this is what I used to see when I was much younger. Very often, a guy, a white guy, walk along, usually good size, and he's carrying a shotgun over his shoulder. You can see that in the picture right here. This man will use that shotgun if there is any attempt at escape, and everybody here knows it. They're working with chains. They can't get far. They can't go fast. And so there's no real incentive for them to try because they know they'll just get captured or they will get killed. Go to the next one. This map was taken, this map was done in 1920, and it highlights a place called Davenport, Florida. None of us probably ever heard of it, but it's down in Polk County, which was the epicenter of the phosphate industry. And the reason that they wanted everybody to come to Davenport was so they could make money on the tourism, but there were no roads. So they're building roads. If you look at this dearth of roads that you see today, you look at a Florida road map, the roads are everywhere. But in this early period, they weren't. They hadn't yet figured out how they could get them built and all. The Tamiami Trail was built with prison labor. So was the Florida East Coast Railway, as we talked about. All kinds of other things were. And they couldn't get enough labor uh, quickly enough to satisfy the people who were trying to make the most amount of money from providing this labor and providing the roads. This again, this is a, uh, the railroad. Uh, this is in Volusia County, which is a part of the plant, excuse me, the, um, the Flagler system, Florida East Coast Railway. And here again, African-American laborers, prison uniforms, that's convict lease. And, and Flagler, he was excoriated in the article that we just saw. If you go to the next one, we'll come back to that in the first slide. This is the same slide we saw a few minutes ago. And it's the article, uh, Slavery in the South Today, much of it in Florida. And, and, and uh, Flagler was absolutely condemned in this article for using the slave labor that he did. And the author says, he is so good at what he does, Flagler, that he has lawyers around him all the time. He won't admit to being wrong about anything, and he won't take responsibility for anything that happens out here. But he doesn't have to, because the system is legal, it's enshrined in law, and he's not breaking any laws, and so life goes on. And the railroad continued to unfold until it reached all the way to Key West. We can go there. This is a map of the peninsular part of Florida and adjacent islands. This is the Florida East Coast Railway. I apologize, most of you can't see this. But the eastern strip of Florida is virtually fully developed. And that is thanks largely to the convict lease system and the people that composed it. The people who did all the work for this and the most owners that you could find derived no benefit from all the labor that they did. And they may not even survive the sentence that they had. In, uh, in 1921, this individual from North Dakota got on a train in Tallahassee without buying a ticket. Okay, that, that's against the law. Okay, so he's arrested. He's taken and he's, he's uh, uh, you know, goes before the judge. Uh, there, there is a, yeah, I'll just read it here, I'll stand. Arrested on a charge of vagrancy in Tallahassee in December of 1921, and he was fined $25, which doesn't seem like a lot of money. But $25 in 1921, if you're as poor as this man, he was out to see the world, he was just a kid, he ran out of money, can't pay his fine, so he contacts his family in North Dakota. And they send $75 to help their, their son and brother out. The sheriff gets that money and sends it back to the family and says, left the area, but doesn't say where. What happened was that Martin Tabor was adjudicated guilty he was sent down to a work camp in Dixie County, about 60 miles south of uh, Tallahassee. And there, shortly after he arrived in January of the next year, he was flogged to death by a guy named Higginbottom, the whipping boss in that place. Higginbottom whipped this man to near insensate, uh, it, it just, just uh, until he was almost out cold. He wouldn't get up, so he kicked him to get up and he started lashing him again. And then he kept doing this. And one of the prisoners counted that he got at least 75 lashes with this terrible whip that this wh whipping boss had. When he got into bed, his skin was coming right off his body. And he died a short time later, about, I understand it was maybe as much as four days. But he never got better from that. And he died of the flogging. Now this is so serious, right? You say, well, what about all those people who died before him? One answer is, he's white and they may have been black. And so there's not the outcry 
that you now have in Tallahassee in, 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 uh, in what, when his case comes now before uh, scrutiny of people who are going to look into it. If we go to the next one, we can see that uh, after his death, Marjorie Stone and Douglas wrote this thing, and she published it in the Conning Tower, and it's Martin Tabert of North Dakota. And it's a, it's a poem of memorialization. People in Florida were aghast that this had gone on, but they didn't know it was happening. It wasn't being reported. But in the case of Martin Tabert, it was reported. And now there's going to be a trial. And now there's going to be, uh, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, re recompense for such a crime. Uh, that was the plan anyway. Now, this is the New York world. Again, Florida was very much in the headlines in those years for uh, having a terrible prison system and an, and an awfully unfair one. Uh, Florida House votes 63 to 15 to end flogging of convicts. New episode of Lash repealed. And so this is, uh, the date of this is April the 19th of 1923. They were still using this awful whip as late as that before they finally stopped it. Now, around the same time, the convict lease system comes to an end. And it's the complete shock of people who read about what was happening to Martin Tabor. Some people who were offended by it were as offended as much as anything because he was forced to work alongside African-American people and there was, no, there was no segregation. They thought, this is barbarous. They're missing the point. What was really barbarous was what was happening to everybody out there, right? So now we move to the next slide. And uh, here again, whipping boss is found guilty of murder for the fatal beating of Tabert in Florida. Unfortunately, he was able to beat the system. Through appeals and through other ways, he was able to get out of that what would have been a terrible sentence and a just one for him. But again, he was able to, to get past all of that. Again, this is a New York Times article. That's okay. It was another New York Times article. People in New York were looking at us and shaking their heads with what kind of barbarism is there that would allow this kind of thing uh, to, uh, to go on. Uh, this is Governor Hardy, and it was Governor Hardy, Perry A. Hardy, who uh, got rid, finally, of the convict lease system. Now, there were two systems. One of them was the state system, and the other was the county systems, plural. The counties were as notorious as anybody. But it took a while longer for the counties to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, invoke uh, or to be reined in with the use of convict lease system. All right, now let's take a minute. The problem is gone, right? There is no more convict lease system, right? Things ought to be better. Next slide, please, sir. Now we come to this portrait of Arthur Malapert. He was a New Jersey hothead, kid that was in trouble a lot, intrepid, absolutely unbelievable in terms of his escapes. He could get out of anything. When he was being taken in Volusia County for so-called um, being adjudicated or being charged with robbing a gas station, while handcuffed, he got out of the police car and jumped over the railing of the bridge in the Halifax River. And they looked for him for a while and said, he must be dead. No, he wasn't dead. And they finally caught him. And they, uh, of course, you know, he winds up in a place called Camp 36. Camp 36 was one of the camps operating near it was called the Sunbeam Prison, which was a, a kind of a, a selection of, of locations there where they were building the road from Bayard over to the East Coast. It was a road building enterprise. Okay, so he's out there and he's working on this, but he keeps escaping. So eventually they, do, they get tired of it. In fact, if we go to the next slide, you can see something here. This man is holding a barrel. Malifort was put in this barrel and then boards were nailed across his shoulders. He was naked inside. Boards are nailed across the shoulders, and there's no way he could get out of this. He chewed through the boards and got out. And he ran through the forest naked, and he was arrested and dragged back. This time, they're so angry with him, they put him in a sweat box. Go to the next slide, please. And they put his feet in specially designed stocks. He cannot lift his feet out of the stocks. The chain that's strung from the top goes around his neck and down, so he can't he can't reach the stocks to get them away from him. In that condition, he languages for less than an hour. And when they check on him, Malifert is dead. He has strangled on the chain. And now there's going to be retribution. There are people who want, they go after the warden of the place. They go after uh, the, uh, the, those who are administering discipline. 
Uh, and from that comes another headline, and that's this one here. Sunday Times Union, which is, let's think of it as the Jacksonville Times Union today, in Jacksonville, a 1932 uh, one. And this is uh, uh, manslaughter verdict for uh, Corson, ends convict case. Higginbottom is acquitted. Higginbottom, I don't know how he was acquitted, but this was Florida back then. And there was just no way Higginbottom was going to be guilty, given the power that he had, and so on. Corson is adjudicated guilty, but once again, it doesn't come to anything. He's able to beat it. So they decide to retry him, but they never get around to it. And that's the end of that story. Now you would think that now maybe things will get better. You'd like to think that. But if we go forward here with another slide, this is, you can tell from the cars, uh, this is the 1950s. This is post-World War II. And you have African-American convicts laboring on the highways. That's because the DOT, the present day DOT, is building roads and they hire now, for, they don't hire, they, they, they take prisoners from the prison system and put them on state road projects. This isn't convict lease because they're not being leased out to private industry, they're being used in, in the, you know, within the state and by the state. This is how they, they justify that, but the sweat box was still being used. It was still being used and, and was uh, continued for a while and people died in them. Uh, if we go to the next one, this is today. I'm moving very fast forward. I'm looking at the time, and we're just about, just about there. We have maybe one more slide to go. This is Lowell Correctional Institution, and it is, there are so many charges against the correction staff because of raping the women who are there. This is, a, this is, a, uh, a, this is for female inmates. And what has a bit alleged to have happened there is nothing less than horrendous. And there are people who are kept always as objects of this untoward interest by people who have the physical power to do that. And there, the Miami Herald has, un, un, uh, has, has unleashed a, a, a whole series of, uh, of reports in the last several years. Um, and they, they print them very often and they publish them quite frequently. And they're going after any number of the, of the cases that they see. Now, it's 100 years since the convict lease system. And here we are now, we're still seeing terrible prisoner uh, treatment. Uh, but even that isn't the end of it. Go ahead, if you will, please. And uh, I'm very much, in dedicate, or very much in dedicate, or indebted to Ms. Ross Booker, who is here as one of our guests, for showing me, sharing with me the documentary 13th, all about the 13th Amendment and all the ways that, that uh, 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 people have, uh, the forces within the state, have managed by subterfuge to get around that and to employ people uh, unfairly and, and w being racially targeted and, and all kinds of things this way. And this list of, uh, of corporations is very familiar to all of us. Exxon, Mobil, DirecTV, Time Warner, State Farm, Walmart, Pfizer, Comcast, DuPont, FedEx, and a whole lot of others. These are industries or corporations that have benefited and benefit now from prison industry work. That is from the forced labor of, of, uh, of people who are incarcerated. Uh, there is, is a, a huge, um, it, it's come to the attention, uh, if we go to the next one there. Um, yes, uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, on top of what you just saw, there is also stuff like this. This is uh, from 2007 when uh, a, a, a story was done, what's wrong with Florida's prisons? This is a Time Magazine article online and it talks about the people who have died under horrible circumstances that there seems to be no justification for, and yet every time it comes to trial, they somehow are not, are not prosecuted or they're not successfully prosecuted. Um, uh, if we go one more time here, um, uh, I'm sorry, would you go back just for a second there? I, I didn't mean to, to leave this out. 14-year-old uh, Martin Lee Anderson being beaten by all these people around him, and it's taped. It's videotaped. There's no way to deny this. But justice just doesn't happen. His mother just exploded in the courtroom uh, after the verdict was announced. He just couldn't stand to, uh, you know, to be there for it. Uh, just in the past couple of years, just three cases that I'll share with you, and then we're pretty much there. Uh, Randall uh, Jordan Aparo, in September the 19th, 2010, was gassed to death um, by prison uh, personnel uh, he was gassed again and again, and, and he had all kinds of trouble breathing to begin with, but 
Uh, it was so bad, and, and the gas was so thick in that small, narrow, tiny cell that it, the gas never even had a chance to dissipate, and he did not survive. And uh, that's, that's still underway, I understand, uh, even though it was in 2010. I'm not sure anybody will. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I didn't get the last word on this case. But the second one is Darren Rainey, scalded to death in a prison shower on July 9th of 2014. He was pushed into a shower, the door was locked, and the water was turned on hot. And those guards walked away. Two hours later, what was left of him was all over the floor, and another prisoner was ordered to do the cleanup with bleach and get rid of the evidence. Cheryl Weimar, not long ago at all, just in August of 2019, less than six, well, about six months ago, in Lowell Prison, when we just saw that, that very aerial view of was beaten so severely, a lady in her 50s, was beaten so severely by, by several males uh, and hit in the throat a number of times and kicked and dragged around where there were no cameras and beaten more, she is a paraplegic. Can't move her arms or her legs. And th there is a judge now looking to block the state from releasing her. The only reason they want to release her is they won't be responsible for her medical bills. These are things that, that I, I, I share with you today. It's, it's as a Floridian, as somebody who was born and raised here, these are horrendous stories. And, and along with that, because I don't want to forget that one of the main things uh, that, that, uh, that I wanted to share with you just before the end is the idea of prison, um, prison labor being used by private industries. There's an organization, Private Rehabilitative Industries and Diversified Enterprises Incorporated, the letters spell PRIDE, P-R-I-D-E, and that's one of the things that's been in the news a lot lately, where people who are incarcerated are forced to do work, and they're, if they're paid at all, it is minimal, is absolutely substandard minimal. There's another, uh, or, uh, another program called PIE, Prison Industry uh, Enhancement, and that also is, is uh, like the other, uh, not freedom to, to decline and, uh, and not much recompense for it. And over all of this is, uh, and we can go to the next slide too, please. Uh, the last slide in the program, I think, is the one that's coming up. Yeah, this is The Nation, and it was published in 2011, and it talks about a program called ALEC. And this is where Ms. Booker and I have, you know, spent some time talking, and I've learned so much from you, ma'am, in the past couple of weeks. I really appreciate it. And that's the American Legislative Exchange Council. And it was, it's one of the reasons that so many people are in prison today. The three, excuse me, the three strikes law, mandatory minimum sentencing even for nonviolent crimes, the explosion of the population in prison um, unequally on African American people and people of color, all this is connected with the ALEC program. And so I invite everybody here, we'll have questions and answers in just a moment, but before we get there, I'm not trying to set you up with anything here, just I just call, I'm quoting from so many sources, it's, it's just hard to name them all in the time that we have. I will invite all of you to stay very much informed on ALEC, PRIDE, and PI, those three programs, and, and if something seems wrong to you, ask questions. Who's deriving the benefit from these programs individually? Who would, who would it be? Who opposes the programs and why? Who's benefiting the most economically from them? And is there something wrong there? These things we have to ask, because we, when we talk about people who are incarcerated, I know, because I see them on a regular basis, there is no one who can speak for them unless it is people that are on the outside that take an interest in their plight and will stay informed and stay, stay ready to share your thoughts and your concerns with legislators and so on. Thank you all very much. I appreciate being here.